Well, thanks. Thanks, Jason. Uh, one of the things about being brothers-in-law is that it comes brings with it a, a certain degree of mutually assured uh, destruction. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate the nice introduction. Uh, I will say that with the House taking up reauthorization of FISA Section 02 just this week, it is timely that I'm in front of you today. Uh, this committee is, as I understand it, the oldest standing committee in the ABA and has for more than 60 years committed to educating the bar and the public on the importance of the rule of law uh, in preserving both the freedoms of democracy and our national security principles that we at the FBI have always strived to adhere to, principles that I believe set the American legal system and our law enforcement agencies apart from our adversaries. So that brings me to the first topic I'd like to discuss today, which is the evolving national security landscape. Today's national security threats are more complex and sophisticated than ever. We're seeing hostile nation states becoming more aggressive in their efforts to steal our secrets and our innovation, target our critical infrastructure, export their repression to our shores, and front and center is China, the defining threat of our generation. To put it simply, the CCP is throwing its whole government at undermining the security and economy of the rule of law world. China's hacking program is larger than that of every other major nation combined. In fact, if you took every single one of the FBI's cyber agents and intelligence analysts and focused them exclusively on China, forget Russia, forget ransomware, forget North Korea, forget all the other stuff, China's hackers would still outnumber FBI cyber personnel by at least 50 to 1. And it's not just cyber, of course. It's traditional espionage, economic espionage, foreign malign influence, election interference, and transnational repression, often working in tandem. They recruit human sources to target our businesses, using insiders to steal the same kinds of innovation and data their hackers are targeting. They're engaging in corporate deception, hiding Beijing's hand in transactions, joint ventures, and investments, again, all with the same goal. They're exporting their repression efforts and human rights abuses, targeting, threatening, harassing those who dare question their legitimacy and authority even outside of China, including right here in the United States. We've seen professors and students on American campuses subjected to intense, almost mafia-style pressure when they say things the CCP doesn't like, using their massive cyber operation to keep tabs on how dissidents in America are exercising their First Amendment rights online. And of course, the PRC plays the long game. China's hackers have been positioning on American infrastructure in preparation to wreak havoc and cause real-world harm to American citizens and communities. China's sponsored hackers prepositioned for potential cyber attacks against U.S. oil and natural gas companies all the way back in 2011. Today, today we're seeing China's increasing build-out of offensive weapons within our critical infrastructure setting up persistent PRC access in our critical sectors like telecommunications, energy, water, poised to attack whenever Beijing decides the time is right. Say, when the PRC decides to invade Taiwan and the Chinese government wants to cripple our military response. Because low blows against civilians aren't just uh, a possibility in the event of a conflict. Low blows are actually part of China's plan. Earlier this year, the FBI and our partners exposed China-sponsored hackers known as Volt Typhoon hiding inside our networks. The Volt Typhoon malware enabled China to hide, among other things, pre-operational reconnaissance and network exploitation against our critical infrastructure. Now, happily, working with our partners, the FBI ran a court-authorized on-network operation to shut down Volt Typhoon and the access it enabled. 
That operation was an important step, but there's a lot more PRC cyber threat in a lot more places out there. And of course, everybody here is well aware that China is hardly the only adversary we're up against. Russia and Iran are also determined to use every available tool at their disposal to take aim at things that we all hold secret, sacred, our freedoms, our prosperity, our democratic norms. Russia is a very sophisticated adversary, and they remain a top cyber threat. The Russian government continues to invest heavily in their cyber operations, in part because they see cyber as an asymmetric weapon to keep up with us. Like China, Russia continues to target critical infrastructure, including things like underwater cables and industrial control systems, both in the United States and around the world. And since its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, we've seen Russia conducting reconnaissance on the U.S. energy sector. Now, adding to that concern is that the Russians, like our other adversaries, don't care if their cyber campaigns affect civilians. You can just look back at what happened in 2017 when Russia's military used the NotPetya malware to hit Ukrainian critical infrastructure. Well, they targeted Ukraine, but ended up also hitting systems throughout Europe, plus the U.S., plus Australia, even some systems within their own borders, showing the same wanton disregard for civilian safety through cyber that, of course, we're now seeing on display on the battlefield itself. They shut down a big chunk of global logistics, and ultimately, their recklessness ended up causing more than $10 billion in damages. That's with a B, billion dollars. Maybe the most damaging cyber attack in history. And Russia continues its campaign to target our secrets, especially our military technology in a variety of ways, from traditional spying to sophisticated cyber intrusions, signals collection platforms, and other technical means. And then you got Iran, which should not be underestimated. They, too, are a very sophisticated and very aggressive cyber adversary and continue to engage in brazen behavior directed at us. In 2021, an Iranian-sponsored group conducted a cyber attack on a children's hospital here in the United States. They're also one of only two countries, the other being North Korea, to have conducted a destructive cyber attack inside the United States. On top of that, in recent years, individuals associated with Iran have plotted to assassinate a former U.S. national security advisor right here on American soil. And like China, they leverage covert means, including their cyber capabilities, to target dissidents and conduct transnational repression, again, right here in the U.S. An American journalist on U.S. soil has been targeted multiple times by Iranian intelligence officials, including most recently for assassination. Last year, we announced that the FBI and our partners had disrupted that assassination attempt, which Iran tried to carry out using an organized crime group. I have no doubt that Iran is going to continue to try to evade international sanctions by stealing our military technology through cyber hacking and illegal technology transfers. And of course, it remains the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. And that brings me to the final threat that I want to talk about today, and that's terrorism. Terrorism is the national security challenges we face, and it remains the FBI's number one priority. I've been very public in saying that at a time when the terrorism threat was already elevated, the ongoing war in the Middle East has raised the threat of an attack against Americans inside the United States to a whole nother level. One big reason for that is the steady drumbeat of calls for attacks that we've seen since October 7th from a veritable rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations groups ranging from Hezbollah to Al-Qaeda to ISIS against America and our allies. 
Hezbollah has publicly expressed its support and praise for Hamas and threatened to attack U.S. interests in the region. Al Qaeda issued its most specific call to attack the United States in the past five years. AQAP, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, called on jihadists to attack Americans and Jewish people everywhere. And foreign terrorists, including ISIS, Al Qaeda, and their adherents, have renewed calls for attacks against Jewish communities here in the United States and across the West in statements and in propaganda. Now, as this group probably knows, these are groups that haven't always seen eye to eye, and that's probably an understatement. Now united in their calls for attacks on us. Given those calls for action, we cannot and do not discount the possibility that foreign terrorists may exploit the conflict to carry out an attack. And while we continue to be concerned about individuals or small groups drawing some kind of twisted inspiration from the events in the Middle East to carry out attacks here at home, the foreign terrorist threat and the potential for a coordinated attack here in the homeland, like the ISIS-K attack we saw at the Russia Concert Hall just a couple weeks ago, is now increasingly concerning. October 7th and the conflict that's followed are going to feed a pipeline of radicalization and mobilization for years to come. Now, there's a lot of national security experience represented in this room. Many of you will remember when our government, our country, was almost exclusively focused on the fight against terrorism. In the 9-11 era against Al-Qaeda or ISIS, in its height, say, 2015, 2016. And of course, everybody here will be familiar with the intelligence community's more recent and much discussed pivot to hard targets and great power competition. Well, what distinguishes the current moment is the breadth of national security threats that we're facing all at once. None of the threats our country, our allies are facing and confronting is going away. In fact, the threats are only growing bigger. On the nation state side, China, Russia, Iran, they're doubling down and heavily investing in their cyber espionage and foreign malign influence operations. And they are not remotely constrained by the rule of law. They're tasking criminals and private sector organizations as strategic weapons against us, whether to hack our critical infrastructure, steal our military secrets, or gain an economic advantage against our businesses. All that, all that at a time when the terrorist threat is very much still with us and, as I said earlier, has reached a whole other level after October 7. America's adversaries are not pulling any punches. They're coming at us with everything they've got. So this is not the time for us to hang up our gloves or take away the tools we need to punch back. And that brings me to what the FBI is doing to stay ahead of and strategically disrupt those threats. Our focus is not only on whether we've got the resources, the money, and the right talent to deal with those threats, to grow, to meet the challenges of the next five, ten years, but also whether we've got the necessary tools to combat our adversaries. And one tool that is indispensable to our efforts to combat threats posed by foreign adversaries is one that's going to expire in just a couple of weeks if Congress does not act, and that's our FISA Section 702 authorities. 702 allows us to stay a step ahead of foreign actors located outside the United States who pose a threat to our national security. And the expiration of our 702 authorities would be devastating to the FBI's ability to protect Americans from those foreign threats. Now, we are glad that so many members of Congress support this critical tool and our use of it and recognize that the value of 702 is pretty much undisputed, whether it's to protect our critical infrastructure, find victims and get them the help they need, or detect foreign terrorists overseas directing an operative here to carry out an attack in our own backyard. And crucial 
to our ability to use 702 to protect Americans is our ability to review intelligence promptly and efficiently through queries. Now, I've already talked about how the PRC is pre-positioning on critical infrastructure across the United States. I'll just pick one example. U.S. person queries were key to discovering where Chinese hackers had successfully compromised network infrastructure at a transportation hub here in the United States, allowing us to alert the network operators so they could mitigate the intrusion. Who knows how much damage those hackers could have caused, not just monetarily, but in the disruption and maybe even the safety of Americans' lives. Effective and prompt notification to victims like those hinge on our ability to conduct U.S. person queries of our existing 702 collection. In another, just one recent cyber case, for instance, 702 allowed the FBI to alert more than 300 victims in every state and countries around the world. Many of those notifications made possible because of U.S. person queries. And U.S. person queries in particular may provide the critical link that allows us to identify an intended target or build out the network of attackers so we can stop them before they strike. And just like in cyber, U.S. person queries continue to be key to identifying terrorists in the homeland, helping us find out who they're working with and what they're targeting, the <coughs> intelligence we may need to stop them before they kill Americans. So while it is imperative that we ensure this critical authority does not lapse, we must also not undercut the effectiveness of this essential tool with a warrant requirement or some similar restriction, paralyzing our ability to tackle fast-moving threats. Now, contrary to what a lot of folks are saying about the constitutionality and legality of U.S. person queries, the law and the Fourth Amendment simply do not require a warrant in order for the FBI to query 702 data. You don't have to take my word for it. Multiple federal district courts and appellate courts have considered the issue, and no court has ever held that a warrant is required for the FBI to conduct U.S. person queries to blind ourselves from information that's already lawfully in our holdings. And when the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court renews the 702 program every year, not once has it found that the law requires a warrant to conduct U.S. person queries. And if the appetite for a warrant is born out of compliance concerns, I can wholeheartedly say that there are plenty of ways to ensure compliance without paralyzing us and our ability to move fast. We've proven that. I have been unequivocal that the compliance incidents we've had in the past are unacceptable. And in response, we've undertaken a whole host of reforms to ensure that we are good stewards of this authority. Now, if you look at the compliance reviews conducted by the FISC, by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and the Department of Justice on queries that were run after we put in place our reforms, let me say that again, the compliance reviews conducted on queries run after we put in place our reforms. Both the FISC and DOJ have recognized that our reforms have resulted in substantial improvements, hitting compliance rates well into the high 90 percent range. And we're going to keep looking for ways to push that number even higher. So if there's no constitutional, legal, or compliance necessity for a warrant requirement, then Congress would be making a policy choice to require us to blind ourselves to intelligence that's in our holdings. And if that's the path that's chosen, I can just tell you that it's going to have real-world consequences on our ability to disrupt all those threats I outlined and our ability to protect the American people. To take, for example, a foreign terrorist organization like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, legally or illegally sending an operative into the United States to conduct an attack. U.S. person queries on the foreign terrorist communications 
or how we're able to potentially learn the extent of what they're planning and how imminent it may be. Requiring a warrant for U.S. person queries, which are typically conducted at the nascency of an investigation at a time when we usually can't establish probable cause or demonstrate exigency, where time is of the essence to get ahead of the bad guys, would be a deliberate and, in my view, short-sighted choice to blind us to the threat of a foreign terrorist in the U.S. planning and even executing an attack. The consequences of tying our hands are not merely hypothetical. Just last year, we discovered that a foreign terrorist had communicated with a person we believed to be in the United States. Only by querying that U.S. person's identifiers in our 702 collection did we find important intelligence on the seriousness and urgency of the threat. And less than a month after that initial query, we disrupted that U.S. person, who it turned out had researched and identified critical infrastructure sites in the U.S. and had already acquired the means to conduct an attack. If we'd had to obtain a warrant to conduct that initial query, based on what we knew at that time, there is no way we could have met a probable cause standard or even an exigency exception. And if we hadn't done that query, we would have lost valuable time we needed to get ahead of that potential attack. Bottom line, a warrant requirement would be the equivalent of rebuilding the pre-9-11 wall. I saw the consequences of that policy choice 22 years ago. and I can tell you, I've spoken with families of victims of that horrific attack. And now, two decades later, I can assure you that none of our adversaries are holding back or tying their own hands, whether to attack us, to steal from us, to put American national security, our economic security, American lives at risk. So among other things, we need lawyers. Folks like you who are committed to educating the bar and the public on the rule of law and on our national security to explain what's law and what's policy, what a warrant is and what it isn't, and to help illuminate the consequences of purposely choosing to limit the American intelligence community from accessing key and timely information for about our foreign adversaries. because. We're in crunch time when it comes to reauthorizing this vital authority. And as the threats to our homeland continue to evolve, the agility and effectiveness of 702 will be essential to the FBI's ability, really our mandate from the American people, to keep them safe for years to come. And we owe it to them to make sure that we've got the tools that we need to do that. So thank you for having me. I think I've got time maybe for a few questions. So thank you. So, so we have time for two or three questions. Um, ask anyone who has a question, raise your hand. When you're called on, uh, state your name, affiliation, speak up so people can hear you, and please limit yourself to a brief question. So um, questions. Glenn? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Glenn Gerstel. Um, as much as I'd like to ask a question uh, about something other than 702, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not able to do so. So uh, I, I was struck by your comment just now about rebuilding the wall, and I wonder if you could just expand on that, because I think all of us around the room, in the room, understand uh, your concerns about the, as you said, the, the effect it would have of blinding you to information already in your possession. But Sure. Uh, I appreciate the question. So to me, if you look back at 9-11, I mean, I vividly remember this. I was, heck, I was in FBI headquarters on 9-11 itself. I spent an awful lot of my time during some of the DOJ stints that Jason was talking about, uh, spending time with the families of the 9-11 victims. Um, and of course, the question in that era was, well, how could this happen? How could 3,000 innocent people get killed like this? And pretty quickly, one of the things that was uncovered was that there had been this wall that essentially prevented the U.S. government from connecting the dots, from sharing information. 
And people said, well, that's the craziest damn thing. How on earth could they build this wall? Well, if you go back and look at it, well-intentioned people, not because the Constitution required it, not because the law required it, but people, maybe well-intentioned, made a, what they thought was a prudential choice to essentially separate those things and to blind the left hand from the right hand. And people say, how could that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it could happen, because what we're seeing right now is an effort, again, not because the Constitution requires it, not because the law requires it, not because compliance concerns require it, to essentially, again, put in place a barrier between our ability to connect the dots. And the thing that makes it's so pernicious in the current environment is today's threats are moving at a faster and faster clip. You go back and look at 9-11, that was an attack that was plotted over months by those attackers. Today's terrorist threats are moving at the speed of social media. The cyber threats, hours, forget days, hours make a difference in how fast you can get to a victim and notify them so they can mitigate an intrusion before real world consequences happen. So speed are, is of the essence. And on top of that, the number of dots that are out there are often fewer in today's threats than there were during that environment. So the ability to lose one dot means essentially potentially losing the ability to prevent the threat uh, altogether. And so again, uh, well-intentioned people but people who are making, I think, in my view, a misguided choice. And that's what it is. I understand that people make these choices based on their personal views, based on whatever motivates them. I can just tell you, as the FBI director, that ain't my view. I think we have a duty to say to the American, I think the American people expect us to say that we're gonna do everything we can within the Constitution, within the law, to keep them safe. And I don't want to be, and I'm not going to be, the one who looks some family in the eye and says, there was something we could have done that was fully lawful, fully constitutional, but we chose not to do it. And now this is what's happened. So that's what I meant by that. Another question from uh, Mary Smith. Okay. Um, Director, what are your thoughts on threats to our democracy, and what can we lawyers do to help? So there are a lot of different kinds of threats to our democracy. Um, you know, f from our end, on the FBI end, we focus on sort of specific kinds of them. Um, so we look at particularly foreign threats, foreign influence operations, foreign cyber attacks, um, and that's one piece of it. And certainly we've already seen Russia and other countries, Iran, China, uh, get in the act of trying to engage in malign influence operations which occur all year long and election interference operations during you know each successive election cycle so there's that piece of it uh, we of course also uh, over decades investigate you know everything from voter fraud to voter suppression to campaign finance violations and those while a very different kind of case and authority those also in their own way represent threats to our democracy. Increasingly, over the last several years, we've started to see uh, an additional threat, which is uh, threats of violence against everything from government officials of all sorts uh, all the way to election workers. And so that's a whole other threat that we're trying to contend with. And so those are the lenses that the FBI uh, comes in. But there, I think the, the other part of your question that I appreciate is that there is a role here for people outside of law enforcement. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing the threat of, uh, like I said, of information warfare. Uh, and there is a role for lawyers and, the, frankly, the public themselves to be discerning and thoughtful consumers of information. Um, and I think there's a, a, a place for everybody, everybody from media outlets to uh, universities to lawyers to just individual uh, members of the citizenry to take on some responsibility for, as I said, being thoughtful consumers of information uh, and thoughtful um, stewards of our democracy. Another question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mark Zaid. Uh, one threat that you didn't mention was that of anomalous health incidents or AHIs. Uh, full disclosure, I represent a lot of uh, 
American personnel, including FBI officials who have been diagnosed with TBIs and are receiving medical treatment from the U.S. government for it. And just a simple question of what, if anything, the FBI is doing that you can discuss to try and pursue those who we believe are criminally attacking our personnel? Well, I won't, uh, given your, your role, you will be well familiar with the, IC, the IC's assessment um, of, of the origin of the tax. But let me be clear, uh, I am firmly convinced, uh, and I don't need any persuading, that the, uh, the symptoms and experiences that uh, both our employees and other employees uh, of the U.S. government are experienced are, are very real and very serious. That's not an open question. The, the, the harder part is figuring out just what caused it and whether a foreign adversary is responsible in some way. And we continue throughout the U.S. government to do work on this and to continue to try to pursue leads that come in and so forth. So that, that work continues. There's not really much I could talk about in a setting like this on that. But then we're also trying to make sure that we're very focused on um, doing whatever we can to, to try to ensure that our employees have uh, the care that they, I think, very much deserve. Uh, the FBI didn't initially get the same authority, for example, that some of the other agencies had gotten. That was changed, and now DOJ uh, is, I think, imminently supposed to be putting out regulations that would allow some of these benefits to start flowing. I think that needs to happen as quickly as possible. Uh, so we're kind of going at it on two fronts. One is the uh, sort of intelligence assessment investigative front, and then the other is the, I guess what I would call the patient care uh, front. So. How about a question uh, from the back row here? Mr. Quinn. My name is John Quinn. From the FBI's perspective, is the post-9-11 intelligence organization and system that has been created working effectively or effectively in order to meet the threats that you've identified? Is, is, are there things that need to be done to improve that system or can we take comfort in the fact that it's working effectively to do the job mm -hmm. that it needs to be doing? So uh, I guess the first thing I would say is one of the most gratifying things I have seen in this job, uh, in this role, uh, especially having been in this very world for a long time and then taken a detour into the private sector where the grass was browner uh, and then came back, uh, um, is how far the intelligence community has come in terms of integration. Um, I, I, words, I think, escape me a little bit to d describe how different it is now. I mean, one way to put it is I've now been in this job six and a half, maybe more than six and a half years. I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've had some friction or even or much less turf battle with any of the other IC agencies. Last time in the 9-11 era, you couldn't have gone a week without that. Uh, we have senior, as in everybody in this room will understand the terminology, SES level NSA and CIA people uh, sitting in my inner circle uh, every morning. Uh, I'm talking and engaging with my counterparts constantly, one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two. I mean, so the glue, the community part of the intelligence community, uh, I would just tell you, is something that every American should be really buoyed by in today's world. Uh, and that, in turn, is not just everybody being good friends and getting along. It means the information is flowing. Uh, and we've moved, I would say, from an era of maybe uh, conflict or, or tension and competition into an era of kind of uh, grudging deconfliction to an era of you know, full-on cooperation to where we are now, which is like integration. Uh, ways where, say, every day, I mean, the FBI's two with the NSA's two is making five or six or seven. I mean, that's, to me, what the, what the American people, I think, rightly expect and deserve, and I think that's what I'm seeing. Now, can it get better? It can always get better, and a lot of the challenges of technology are making, um, are, are sort of imposing heavier burdens on all of us whether it's the avalanche of data that has to be uh, gotten through, whether it's the speed of the threats, 
whether it's AI, um, whether it's cryptocurrency, uh, whether it's the challenges of uh, warrant-proof encryption. I mean, there's a whole range of technological advances that are putting strain on our ability to, uh, to do the job. But the one really bright spot, I would say, is that the, the partnerships and the relationships, the cohesion that exists in the intelligence community is, uh, is just breathtakingly uh, positive uh, and something I'm grateful for uh, every day. And I think, I hope you get a little bit of a flavor of it from my, from my answer. So. Well, we have time for one last question. Uh, and direct direct. I work for Nick Demos, director of Scott Tucker, and we're having struggles with budget constraints. Nashville, Cleveland, Anchorage. In terms of footprint, have we thought, are we supporting you? Can we work together to support this mission in terms of how the G the 702 will affect the community? Budget constraints are a huge problem. Any plans in place considering the budget complaint? So, uh, first off, you're absolutely right that budget constraints are a real concern. Um, we, in fiscal 24, are dealing with a budget uh, that amounts to a $500 million cut. Uh, and everywhere I turn, somebody's got a great idea, and I don't mean that sarcastically, of what it is the FBI needs to be doing more of. I haven't found anybody with any responsible ideas of what it is the FBI can be doing less of. So cuts of that magnitude to our budget uh, means cuts to our ability to go after violent crime. Last year we arrested something like 50 bad guys per day, every day, all year long. So cuts to our violent crime means more bad guys on the street, more neighborhoods at risk, more children at risk. I already talked about the, the China threat and the scale that that represents. China ain't cutting their budget. Uh, so cutting our budget, you know, in effect is a kind of form of unilateral disarmament against the Chinese. The cyber threat, we're investigating something like 100 different ransomware variants, each one of them with scores of victims. That's just ransomware. Uh, cutting our cyber budget means more ransomware attacks, which are now against hospitals, schools, 911 call centers. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the threats from the border, the cartels. We've got close to 400 investigations just into cartel leadership. Cuts to that means a boon to the cartels. Fentanyl. Hardly a week goes by when I'm not coming across some FBI field office that in one seizure is seizing enough fentanyl to wipe out an entire state. Cuts there means more fentanyl on the streets, more lives put at risk. So who does cutting the budget help? It helps the violent criminals, the child predators, the Chinese government, cyber hackers and ransomware actors, uh, the cartels, et cetera, terrorists. Um, and who does it hurt? It hurts our law enforcement partners, state and local law enforcement partners who depend on us every day in all whole host of ways. And ultimately, it hurts the American people and the neighborhoods that we're all sworn to protect. So uh, that's a problem. We're going to mitigate and muddle our way through the impact of those cuts this year. But the key is to make sure that Congress doesn't double down on it uh, going into 25, because then we're really going to have a problem. Uh, and I appreciate um, you know your division's role in helping us kind of do the best we can um, to find efficiencies and, and look for ways to kind of mitigate the impact of the cuts. But make no mistake, um, it, it is a, a form of, of setting us back at a time when we need to be launching forward, not backwards. I think your voice is helpful to all the Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Director. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a, a unique souvenir. Oh, great. We have a, a one-of-a-kind standing committee souvenir. One of our late members, uh, Dick Friedman, was an amateur welder and put together a, a horseshoe for good luck, I guess. <laughs> uh, I would say one-of-a-kind, but two of your predecessors have these, so my pleasure to present that. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.